Hampton Media is audio taping and North Street Community Association is really good. There you go, sure. Yeah, you remember the time. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, first up for approval are the minutes from the March 23rd meeting. Anything I approval? Approval? Second? I had it, uh, one year and then it was Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, was it an incomplete sentence on the top of the last page? Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know something. Okay. I didn't know the last sentence. Well, I didn't know something was left out or what could be left. So you mean it was a sentence fragment? It was a random thought. It was a random thought. All right. All in favor of having those minutes? Aye. Aye. Excellent. All the rounds. Uh, I would ask that uh, item number seven, the pay as you throw discussion. Actually, I, th I think I think they're here for the informational solid waste task force. Is it? Uh, you know, it no. We knew this was in your pack, but we didn't quite know what you were going to do with it, so we just thought we'd show up and listen. Okay, so this is the, these are the uh, the co-chair of the solid waste task force, uh, and uh, they're presenting their recommendations to us this evening. So could I have a motion to take informational number one out of order? So moved. Second. All in favor of hearing Aye. from the co-chair? Aye. 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 Well, I, I hadn't planned on speaking. I'm going to mark the lights here. I just got from Florida a few hours ago. <laughs> I heard it was on your desk. Um, so the cake, uh, would you give Mark, your name? Mark Carmine and... Uh, Dirk Hill Road, uh, co-chair of uh, Solid Waste Production and Management Task Force, along with Wendy Foxman. Um, so we understood that the recommendations were sent out on Friday in your packet for tonight's meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So we just, Wendy and I thought we would be here tonight. Um, in case anybody had any questions, basically, on it, I think that the task, the recommendations are pretty, um, pretty clear, uh, pretty self-explanatory, but there may be some questions. Um, a couple points I wanted to make was that um, among the charge, uh, in the charge that we got from the mayor for the task force, is that any recommendations we make that require funding be funded through the enterprise fund, Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. And uh, we believe we're within that charge, uh, given the projected income and expense, a surplus in the enterprise fund. If you look at table four that was handed out to you, um, in the packet, table four is part of our report, page six. Well, actually, it's an addendum to the report. Yeah. Um, for option one, keeping the current system of collecting um, based on a per vehicle permit fee going up to $75 per uh, permit fee and uh, also revenue staying at two dollars per 35 gallon board uh, 35 gallon bag um, uh, and then the projected expenses of keeping the two transfer stations open as far as operations equipment and labor and other direct fixed costs there will be a surplus projected at one hundred eleven thousand dollars per year um, and we believe that any recommendations the the, there are a few recommendations that we're making that do require some funding, and um, we believe that we've stayed within uh, our charge um, to cover those recommendations with that surplus money. Um, I also want to point out that there's been a lot of talk that 50% of the households in Northampton uh, use the transfer station, and 50% of the households in Northampton use a private hauler to pay about uh, $400, $450 a year for that service. That is, again, 50% of the uh, households take uh, to the transfer station, 50% bring their trash to the end of their driveway and pay about $400 per year for uh, their trash removal. But that is actually not correct. You see in uh, Table 4, they're the same table I just referred to, that in fact, according to the census, there are and this is an important detail, um, so I don't, I won't, go, I won't belabor it too much. But just to say, according to the 2000 census, 2010 is not available yet, but um, probably not too different, I imagine. 11,800 households in Northampton, of which 
there are 9,320 households that are in the one to four family, one to four unit uh, households. That leaves a balance of about, um, quick math here, 2,500 uh, households that are in uh, greater than four units per household or in large um, apartment complexes or condo complexes. Those folks have their trash removed by dumpster, um, often by a dumpster, and the cost of that trash removal is folded into their rent or con monthly condo association fees. They do not bring their trash to the end of the driveway. They do not pay about $400 per year to have their trash removed. That leaves, <clears throat> that means that about um, 5,800, well, 5,800 vehicle um, permits are sold to use a transfer station, which is about 50% of the total households in Northampton, uh, leaving um, about um, uh, well, leaving the difference there, 5,800 from 9,300 is uh, I don't have the math right in front of me, but roughly 3,500 households that uh, we believe, 3,500 households or 37% of the total households in Northampton um, take their trash to the end of the driveway and pay about $400 a year. So their numbers go 50% use a transfer station, 37% um, have a private subscription with a hauler, take their trash to the end of the driveway and pay about $400 a year, and 13% uh, use the dumpster in the parking lot and have their cost for trash removal folded into their rent or monthly condo association fees. And that's the breakdown. Um, so I wanted to clarify that because there's been a lot of talk of 50-50, and it's, that's not actually true. Wendy? Well, I just wanted, as sort of an afterthought, to acknowledge both you, uh, Terry Colhane and Rose Schmidt, who served on the committee, and also Mimi Rogers is here who served on the committee just uh, yeah. because we did our time together. <laughs> it's not all about the chair people. Right, not and, at all. <laughs> and I also want yeah. to say that we were really blessed on the task force to have the hard work of the DPW staff um, being on the task force. Um, uh, Carol Boquillen, um, uh, Jim Larilla, and David Valletta really went above and beyond um, their 50-hour, 60-hour work weeks to be uh, on the task force, to attend the meetings, and to take uh, excellent notes, and also to produce these tables and uh, deal with our multiple minutia emails. Um, so you guys, are, we were, we're very lucky to have that. Um, so, uh, Mark, I, is it fair to say, and you know, I don't know if anybody has a response to what Mark has just presented, but is it fair to say to sort of capture what you've just said, 37% of the eligible, that would be the one to four family households, participate in, uh, have private collection. Right. That's, does that number means agreeable to people? If what you've said is correct. Of the total eligible. Yeah, if you assume that no one with a sticker also has private Right. Subscription. Right. No, There's no real no, no, science no, to figuring out right. how many people. The assumption is that one vehicle per household, one sticker per household, but we know, in fact, there is multiple stickers. Um, Steve and I have two stickers, one for each of our cars. We know people who have private haulers who come to their end of their driveway who also has a sticker to use the transfer station. There's just no way so to have So by it. your math, then, 37% may under-report. Right, or over-report, in fact. Um, well, is, so, is, the, is the distinction important in terms of the recommendation? Are you saying that? No, I, I think it's important because um, there's been some people who believe that if 50% use the transfer station and 50% pay $400 a year, that it's 50-50 um, in how trash is collected. And that's not true. It's ignoring, it's, it's in fact 50, 37, and 13. But what's the importance of that number in terms of, does that change, are you saying that the recommendation is not option one? No, 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 the recommendation is certainly option one, and it's backed up with the, um, based, it is, came to through a, a variety of uh, methods of analysis and 
data collection and hearing from the public. Um, and in fact, um, that needs to be underscored that it is of the three different ways of uh, disposing of trash, either taking to the transfer station, having a private subscription hauler come to your driveway, or throwing in the dumpster in the parking lot of your large condo or rental uh, apartment complex. It is 50% of the households, total households in Northampton, use the transfer station if you use the assumption of one vehicle sticker per household. 5,800 vehicle stickers are sold on the average over the course of three years. Um, 5,800 stickers have been sold. So, right. so the, the, the task force basically is recommending, and see, if, see if I paraphrase this right, mm -hmm. they came down in favor of trying to maintain the transfer station next door and the one out on Glendale Road. They would like to see that be our plan moving forward once the landfill closes. Uh, they were not disinterested in curbside pickup, but at the very least didn't think this was the time to, to uh, move forward on that. Uh, there are a couple of programs they would like to see expanded. Uh, something to do with organics, for example. Um, they general, generally look favorably on uh, programs to pick up hazardous waste or difficult to, man you know, to, to deal with, to accept hazardous waste, uh, difficult to manage waste like tires or mattresses. Um, the rec they recommend that the uh, city should change from stickers on the bags to actual Northampton trash bags. Um, is there anything else specific? Did I miss something big? The reuse, reuse kit, some kind of an expansion of reuse. Uh, that was a big uh, public. Right, a lot of interest in some kind of uh, place where you could drop off serviceable merchandise that someone else could take a look at, and perhaps take away. Um, Mark, does that do you think that well, fairly summarizes the? It's all here for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Those are the big ones. Um, keeping, in my opinion, big. <laughs> Um, another big one, I think, is definitely um, to go forward with the exploring of the use of solar panels on the landfill to generate um, yeah. revenue to help um, save revenue and generate revenue for some of these programs and even going forward. Um, solar panels, I know this is uh, concurrent with the work of the Smith um, students and um, hopefully supplementing that work and underscoring uh, based on our research in the course of five months. Um, that we underscore that doubly. <laughs> um, so the only other thing we had two hearings, and at the first we had over 70 people, and we had um, 100, I believe, at the second. We, as you know, it, this is an important, volatile issue. Whatever you have to do with trash in the city, so um, we support your efforts and support your efforts to involve the community, but make whatever decisions you need to make based on the evidence and information that you, you've got. Right. Okay. And it's, um, you know, I believe that it affects every household in Northampton, so how could it not be a hot topic? Um, and uh, our, our charge, and I think something that we did very well with these recommendations, is to really re look at reducing waste. And we recognized soon on, soon after we started, the, way, the best way to do that is to increase the recycling rate and increasing uh, composting. To take those two elements out of the waste stream to reduce the amount of waste that we actually generate as a city. And so these rec most of these recommendations are around reducing waste, either through recycling or reuse or repurposing. Um, and also um, increasing composting options, either at home, backyard, or through, for those who can't do that, through collecting of the composting at the transfer stations. Um, and so that was our primary focus of reducing waste. And so these uh, that's what these recommendations are. Do you have a question or a comment? No. No. Well, one small comment. <laughs> We're still pursuing the DPW property, the state DPW property, yes. to expand the recycling and so on there. Yes. It's right. just moving really slowly. It's in Capital Improvements Committee. 
Oh, it is? Yes. So it's speeding up. It's been seven years. Maybe do it I, I was just going to say that um, for the resource recycling area, why it was so important is I think one of our recommendations is that a task force could be set up to try and find a temporary home for it somewhere in the city, um, you know, to, so that we could at least try and just see the pro actually run it and see what the problems that would arise from it and everything else, and then that data would help when you finally to do something that would be more permanent. So. That does seem to be a big constituency for some kind of uh, program like that. And the task force thought maybe we could get some volunteers from that group. Volunteer. Uh, Mark or Wendy? I, I'm not volunteering. No, I'm volunteering. Mimi was actually the first volunteer at the, at the uh, recommendation when she, but I'm going to be the second volunteer. Great. Right. I just wanted right, to Mark, add the reason why we were, we were a split committee on, on this option. Um, it was a tight vote, um, and I think w one of the things is, as you all know, with the with the Valley Recycling, uh, or is that what it's called? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, the closure, landfill, the changes at the MRF, all of these things, we just thought that there were shifting grounds and there might be new information, and that uh, take your time in moving to to a, a curbside collection program. Right. That that's why we just to give a little more background to why we. Those of us who voted in the majority voted that way. I was thinking now we could revert to Jim's, uh, since we have some members of the task force here, to go to item number seven. And go ahead and discuss it. Ned? Uh, just a, a small note here. Um, when I walked out of here, Mark was talking about the solar rays on the landfill. The Smith College Picker Engineering students are doing a public presentation on the 19th, which is next Tuesday, at 7 p.m. at JFK at the community room on their, their senior design clinic. You say the uh, time and date again? 19th at 7 p.m. Uh, JFK community room. Ned, is that being advertised anywhere else so that the general public will know? It's on the blog and it will be probably on A3 in the Gazette. Okay. And Northampton Media is going to definitely cover it, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, are you going to, any further questions or comments for the, the chair people, no? Or the other members? Mm -hmm. Are you going to make a, a motion? I, would, I am going to uh, make a motion that we, that we respond to the um, solid waste uh, task force and approve pay as you throw um, unit face bags for the city. So you're moving. All right, first, first of all, thank you both for coming. I'll second it for purposes of discussion. Oh. Well, I'm here all the time. <laughs> it's easy to forget about me. <laughs> no, 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 that's not true. Um, well, thank you all. Uh, so are you moving that we? Take question seven out of order. I am moving, first of all, that we take set question seven out of order. Okay. Then second, I'm making a proposal, which Jim has seconded for purposes of discussion, that we do honor the um, Solid Waste Task Force recommendation to do patient throw backs. Okay. So all in favor of taking seven out of order? Aye. All right. Okay. Uh, now, all right, so the motion has been made and seconded to approve the pay as you throw a recommendation. Uh, I do have a question about uh, the size of the bags and so on. Uh, half of the Actually, people. Would this be a good thing? Karen, I believe, has, is prepared to make a presentation. Oh, that's great. She has samples, bag samples to pass yeah. around. And I believe that you all got um, this proposal by email on Monday. No, Monday? Yeah, what's yeah. an email? Yeah. 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 So, so this proposal has two sizes of bags that would be handled through retailers. And um, the medium size is 14.8 gallons and the larger size is 35.6 gallons. The larger size is quite a bit larger than you know a standard garbage bag, but it will line a you know, a, a Rubbermaid, you know, barrel 
And I do have a couple of samples of those. Um, this one is from Taunton. See, they're really huge. You can pack that around. That's, that's the 35.6. And this is another one. Is Sugar Hill a town? Yes. In um, North Carolina. Oh. This is the same size. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because the bag sticker says up to 40 pounds for, for two months. Yes. Do you need a... Um, so if we were interested in going forward, so you're recommending the drawstring bags for the medium and large. And I guess we'd have to pick the town color, or at least for the first order. Um, I have a color chart. Gary suggested a blue and gold. I think <laughs> we should just say blue um, devils on it. <laughs> the, these are the standard colors. And basically, these kind of represent the um, how opaque they are. So you can see that that light tan bag would be really over in this section. And then you know, the, the more pigment they put into it, the darker it gets a little bit. I like the green. But, um, so, but you can get custom colors in there. Between orders, I understand there may be a little bit of variation among the colors, but if you yep. pick a standard color, it will pretty much stay in that range. I haven't really researched, and I, and I need to, what other pay-as-you-throw bag systems are in the area and what their colors are, so that we don't duplicate the, you know, say it. You know, oh. okay. have, what is it? Hatfield has yellow bags or something, but so that may influence it. We don't want to take a color that's already taken. Pea green. Mark, you have a question. A um, couple points to make. Um, one is the recommendation actually calls for the bags that Northampton buys to be made from mostly recycled plastic. So I hope that that recommendation is um, continued. Actually, they do. Um, okay. And secondly, um, just important note that. Um, People, the idea is that people can still continue to use their 13-gallon tall white bags in their, um, in their, to, for ease of uh, implementation, that people can, it'd be important to uh, communicate that people still can use their tall white kitchen trash bags that they buy for seven cents at Costco's for however little they pay. It's just that those bags can need to get put into the 35, 40-gallon bags. Put two or three in they can put two or three in, and so that's an important piece. I'd also strongly encourage that you um, that not only are these bags made uh, available at retail shops, but that they also be made available at um, the DPW office and perhaps at the at City Hall, perhaps uh, at uh, other municipal offices that are easy to access besides 9 to 5 on Locust Street, uh, perhaps uh, city schools if they're open to that, um, so that people have many opportunities to buy their bags, not just being told to go into one of 10 retail shops or one of 15 retail shops. This is a point that Councilman Barge brought up at the meetings is that we don't want to steer people towards businesses who may then buy a gallon of milk or have to you know, buy some bread or, or whatnot, but not encouraging uh, any particular business, but in fact have it be perhaps municipal offices also um, that they're available as wide enough, as wide a range as possible, not just retail shops. The enticement is answer. The enticement for business is if you're located exactly. in business and people come in, they will buy a gallon of milk. Right. And, and the city they're handling these for nothing. Right. Well, I just want to second Mark's thing about the schools because I was just going to say that, that I was actually thinking that same thing. Like, you know, for a lot of people, they they go in with their kids, so having it there. Um, the other thing is, and this is just a rec my own recommendation, but when it gets introduced, it'd be nice if, like, everybody would just get one free bag when they pay for their, you know, just sort of a way to get people used to it. That's just Very something you guys selection. can take. You like guys can, uh, small. that's food for thought for you yeah, guys. That's about great idea. Idea. Yeah. So. Jim? Uh, I think making these bags available in certain public locations may be a little problematic in terms of staffing and money handling and resource issues, finding people to deal with this. Um, one of the beauties of the bag systems that people use through the state contract is that all the accounting is done and managed for us through this contract, and it's not something that we need to get We need to, to spend a lot of resources managing. Right. So there are some factors that, that are involved with making a decision about putting these making these bags available, not only here in this office, but in, in schools or other public locations. 
I mean, we have a high. I, think, I think the gist of the recommendation is just that we be open to looking for as many possible ways to distribute them as possible. I don't think it's a, a requirement. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe over time we can think of <clears throat> just be creative about, you know, if this won't work, maybe that would work, or maybe it won't. But I mean, I hate we to be the bad guy. We, you know, we're the yeah. Yeah, most the bad guy. <laughs> but we have, you know, we public works. This is what we do, and we have a hard time on finding resources to do the work that's in our charge, and then asking the school department to do things or other departments to do things that are not really associated with their charge and resource issues. That's right. When? Well, I was just going to back Jim up. <laughs> um, working in lots of different towns, who've gone stickers and bags. And, most towns uh, have kept it at two places, the town hall and, and sometimes even with a department that's hardly ever there, like the Board of Health um, and, the, and the transfer station. So um, I agree. I think it would be a, a, a kind of a management problem to have it at the schools and all over the place like that. Um, so I agree that it should be a go with it, figure out what, what will work. Um, and the Mark just reminded one of the conversations that we had was or recommendations that came to us was uh, the idea of possibly putting advertising on the bags as a revenue source, but um, we didn't explore that in any way, but that was discussed. Sure. I, don't, it I don't know how that works anywhere else, sure. uh, if that's been used yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to remind you that they're $10 each package, mm -hmm. no matter what size bag it is. And so there's some inventory control and security that you have to keep in in mind. And I have been talking directly to the retailers, and they're doing this as a community service. Um, and that's difficult for them in these times, it really is. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things they are looking for is, is foot traffic. And being part of, you know, when we're advertising, who's participating, they right. get a little bit of recognition for stepping up. And, and I say 10 retailers, that's how far I've gotten so far. I, I have lots of others that I can I need to visit. I was kind of going for the larger ones first. Mm. Who are they? I, I, I think because I was um, asking them for um, an expression of interest rather than complete commitment, I would rather not name them each. But I can say that, that we have the four largest Questions. Just one quick one, Dave Reed, Northampton Media. How many bags were you talking about getting in the first go round? Well, we're um, the, the initial order would be five thousand of the small bags, fifty thousand each of the medium and large size bags, and that would be. Um, at least a six month order, but we would have to, we would reorder depending on how fast they're going, if they're going faster than that, and we order sooner. But at this time, um, you know, we, I, I actually have some of that background information, but I don't so, know if you need that detail. So the vendor, the, this vendor's been pre approved through a statewide process. They're doing this for towns all across the Commonwealth. They manage the whole thing. We order the bags. They sit in their warehouse. They get the orders directly from retailers, fulfill the order, keep track of the money coming and going, and send us a check-in and accounting every month for what has happened over the past month. It's actually a pretty good plan, and it's completely institutionalized within the state's purchasing system and bidding system, we don't have to wonder, is this a good deal versus uh, are we getting a square deal on this? One of the things I like about this is it has no sales tax. You, know, you pay $10 for bags and, and they don't give you a sales tax on it. So that's, that's a good thing. You can't buy bags now and get an exempt sales tax. Uh, so. The gentleman in the back. Uh, Mike Janik from Pencastle Drive in Florence. Uh, how many bags for the $10? It depends on the size. So it's 20 for the smallest bag. It's 
10 for the medium size bag and 5 for the large size bag. So it's 50 cents for the small bag, dollar for the medium size bag, and $2 each for the large size bag. Mark. One of the things we didn't um, say yet, but it needs to be said, is uh, one of the primary reasons why I and in support of uh, the bags, and I think it, I think this was voiced by a number of task force members, is with the bag, people, we have been told by uh, Arlene Miller, who was our um, representative from the Department of Environmental Protection at every meeting, uh, whose job it is, is to work with municipalities around Western Massachusetts, helping them with their solid waste management. She came to all of our meetings, and she was an invaluable resource for us. She told us that without a doubt, uh, it has been shown over and over that when you go from stickers to bags, you increase your recycl recycling rate, um, you decrease your amount of municipal solid waste, and um, there's a number of reasons for that, primarily uh, perhaps psychologically, you know, people are much more conscious of what they're putting into a $2 bag as opposed to what they used to put into a 15 cent bag. Um, and they're much more careful about what they put in that bag. And perhaps then they're going to divert the recycling or the compost. The second thing um, that it does is it takes away the burden of the gatekeepers from handling thousands of dollars of cash every day and weekend. And the potential of um, criminal activity to these mostly retired, um, I don't want to generalize who they are, uh, to these people, uh, these uh, hardworking uh, city employees, we do not need them to be in fear of their safety because they have thousands of dollars of cash in their pockets. And finally, um, those people who choose for whatever reason, uh, deliberately or not, to not put the proper size sticker on their bag, um, that plenty of people put either too small a sticker on their bag or no sticker at all. And that happens, and, and it takes away the policing aspect from the gatekeeper's job. They don't have to be police officers. In fact, they can be ambassadors now for recycling. They can be uh, educators towards uh, how to recycle, what to recycle, when, and compost. So th that's our primary motivators for moving from stickers to bags. Um, I lived in Belchertown in 1990, and they did this same uh, type of thing. They used clear bags. And it wasn't well received at first, but as it went along, it became easier for people. Because again, you do see your trash. Mm -hmm. So it did work there. And if you want to, I don't know if anybody's contacted Belcher Town, but they use clear bags instead of the, the colored ones. There's a little bit of an uproar when we suggest <laughs> clear. Yeah, yeah, and then I heard some of those yeah. from some of the residents. So um, it, it did work over there. It, it, it's just I probably will take some time. That's all to get used to it. Any other questions, Mike? Does the, um, does the bag vendor get a fee for the service that they provide? We, we, don't, we don't get the whole $2 for a That's bag. Right. We get about $1.65. Yeah, actually, they, they add $0.03 cents per bag. $0.03? They cents. add what? Well, it's actually, for the large bag, it's $0.03. Cents. For the medium-sized bag, it's $0.02. Cents. For the small bag, it's not. So we get $1.97? So it's yeah, it's tacked on to the state contract price for the bag. grant is three cents per bag. So so instead of being twenty um, medium sized bag costs seventeen point three cents. So if without the service you could get the bag for fifteen point okay. three cents. So they the, do the, tack the, that on. Right. The experience of the state, though, is you actually sell more bags than you would have sold stickers, right? And that includes the shipping and the inventory and the uh, invoicing and the everything. Right. And Terry, I have one other very minor comment. And I'm presuming that we're considering adopting this as written. And I just had one yes. edit. Yeah. And it was, um, if it's correct, under timeline, the second bullet, that's the one that says beginning September 1, 2011. At yeah. the end of the sentence, it says, must be containerized in EAYT. And I think we need the word bags. I, uh, 
Yeah, yeah actually, there's a, a final version that didn't get distributed. Uh, did you send out the? Oh, I sent you both. Can you like both of them? The one you sent me to instead? Yeah. Like the two. Uh, there's a there's a final version that says bags after the PAYT. Well, that's, that's, that's the one I want to go to. <laughs> so, do you need us to tell you what, what flavor bag? You could um, tell me a preference and I will do the research about any other bags in this area that might cause a okay. conflict. There, it looks like there's dark blue. And then what, if you have dark blue, what color printing, what kind of options do you have on the color well, of the I print? Think if you get much darker than that blue, the contrast will... So sure. black is the only choice for the printing? I would say yes, if you go with a dark blue. Well, well there's green on the, well, uh, what the base. Well, there's sense for this other available. This yeah, well, I think you'd have to double My next question, is yellow available? Shot. Because then we would have the blue and gold, blue devil. Nobody I, else would have those colors, right? No, that would be unique. The only thing I know about the Duke. printing is if you, yeah, if you really want it to be... They don't generate any cash. Um, you, might have, you might have to double print it to make the yellow... Really pop? Pop out. To look more like gold? Yeah, and the, the inks on this, you can tell on, a, on this film, are, are pretty Cheap. thin. Cheap. Doesn't have to last. Let's not forget long. we're throwing these out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't think it is, you know, the team. How about, how about we could have a break gold cross? <laughs> okay. Oh, well, can we do that? Oh, Choose sure. the string? Yes. <laughs> the sure. Do we know where they're manufactured? Um, I think in North Carolina. Oh. And I checked the, the other. So we do get two facts. There are, um, yeah. there are other vendors on the state contract, but they don't do the whole inventory thing, and, and the bags are manufactured in Texas. So I'm trying to figure out if we can pull apart the color from the rest of it. Oh, so can, um, we, can we vote on the proposal, and then you check with yes, the neighboring towns? Yes, absolutely. And you can decide on the color later. The next thing, the next step is really the line of the, the retailers and you know, maybe at another meeting I could come back with a proposed design for... One thing you could decide is whether you want know, the plastic sleeves or the box. The box is more expensive. The retailers, most of them are going to be keeping them at the registers rather than on the shelves because you know, when you think about all the little convenience stores, that they can't be putting this on the shelf. So they'll have them that, you know, for, for security reasons and other reasons, they would have them at the cash register. But the boxes are recycled, the plastic sleeves are not, correct? Right? Could you... So if we decided to move forward on this, could you get back to us? I mean, yes. I would say, well, if they wanted one way or the other, maybe we should just give them... Yeah, maybe I, I'll be spending more time with the retailers and get a better idea. Okay. And especially, you know, the, the larger retailers really will, will be the ones, that, the ones that are ordering them in pallets, which are, a pallet is $16,000. Whatever they, they want to do, I will go with. Yeah. Is, is there a cost difference between that in a box? Yes, the boxes are more expensive. Then we should go with the boxes. Well, Jim? How much? Man? I was going to say if the board had a preference for color, they could make that tonight. And then if there was a problem with it with the name of the community, would let you know and give you another color. If you're so inclined, that we could move forward if everything is fine. I think Gary's on this one. Or make good choices. Yeah. I just want to, I, I kind of agree with you. That was my first thought that you go with a cheaper option, but I wonder if the retailers might influence that because yeah. that little round thing might be tricky to stack. Yeah, I, I think actually 
out of, uh, you know, with the, with the larger retailers who are you know, probably going to do the bulk of the sales, I think we should find out what they're doing. I mean, they, they may come in a case. different. Yeah, that. actually, like, for instance, Stop and Shop and Big Y, they're doing this for other communities, so they do it both ways. Um, so, plastic's made from oil, and the box is made from paper. Paper's a little more recyclable. Consider that part of your decision making. What's the Although that's cost? a little bit more expensive. What is the difference in cost? Are we talking about two pennies or five or? Um, I actually can't answer that exactly. So you'll come back with uh, some feedback yeah. from the retailers and the, and the there's, difference in there's price. There's quite a bit I can do between now and the next meeting, which is basically, you know, getting the retailers. And getting more information from Gentleman back. Uh, Bouchertown did a rubber band. They did, they did a rubber band. And, uh, exactly how that was done. Right. Did a rubber band, so it would be even more cost effective. And Mark? Um, one thing I want to point out is that the cost for disposing of a 40 gallon or 35 gallon bag, and there is a 5 gallon difference, however, you when it comes to tying up the bag, you can't put actually 40 gallons in because you have to tie it up or cinch it. And so you can't, so the, the difference between a 35 gallon bag and a 40 gallon bag is kind of minimal. But the cost is still $2 per bag. And one of the things we heard at both the community forums and at the public comment section before each one of our meetings was that people were going to be willing to pay more per bag to toss the bag. Pay more and, and actually we have, we were kind of expecting that it would cost more to dispose of our trash the um, surprise for me personally was that it still was going to cost two dollars per 40 gallon bag to dispose of my trash my vehicle permit will go up to a projected 75 dollars uh, per year instead of 25 dollars but the cost for getting rid of and so we heard from a number of people they're willing to pay 250 or three dollars per bag because uh, if that would mean that there would be some environment some waste reduction measures taken if the waste reduction measures cost 50 cents more per bag so be it and the, the balance is you can't make that too expensive to get rid of your trash because then you increase illegal dumping and litter. Um, I, I thought that you can recycle plastic bags. I mean, like you, they yes. they turn them into decking material. So the plastic material holding that wouldn't that be recyclable? Uh, that's, it's stretchy plastic film that's recyclable and oh. that's uh, crinkly. Okay. Not stretchy. So. All right. <coughs> I didn't couldn't tell. Um, I think that the cost of the bag is supposed to represent the variable cost of um, disposal, the disposal cost, the cost of the bag. With disposal, and the permit fee is supposed to be reflecting fixed costs. But tonight, the discussion is bags, right. not pricing. Right. I just wanted to explain it. It's based on the variables. And we're assuming the pricing is staying level because of the Well, one of the advantages of doing it now while the landfill is still open is we have a much larger enterprise fund and we can. We can actually, in a sense, afford to figure this out. Um, next year, when we're trying to implement option one without the landfill, it just takes a huge number of variables onto the table if we've got a year's worth of experience with these bags. Jim, the proposal is distributed to include the proposed price. No, I, I, my, my, uh, I think the pricing. You, do you want a pricing, Amanda? Uh, well, we think the pricing is is adequate to cover the cost of disposal. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but my my point is we weren't. I, I, we're not at the point yet where we have to really dig into that. We we have the luxury of just you know moving forward with the, the pricing model that we have right now. 
to change it later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. It really does correspond to what we have now, a quarter of a sticker and half a sticker. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I do call that question. Second. So all in favor of approving this proposal uh, as you see it with the ex uh, the one that we didn't see but that says bags after paging <laughs> meeting so you can get to work on this mm -hmm. and come back with uh, some feedback on colors boxes versus sleeves you know the, the subsequent decisions that we need to make great thank you well get, just make sure that you, you get what you need to place the order Well, the task force helped. I mean, that, you know, let us know how we can help further. Let him know. For that one, that one thing. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So. And Marie is here to discuss uh, water sewer rates, general uh, fund information. So the next item on the agenda is the uh, FY 2012 water rates. about the enterprise funds and what you're looking at. Obviously, uh, in, inside the water and sewer enterprise funds are the new DPW facility and the construction of it, even though it hasn't been approved by the Capital Improvements Committee. In fact, that conversation is ongoing as we speak and has not been approved by the City Council. This is the same thing that happened last year. You approved potentially constructing a facility in last year, I believe, in FY. Nine, we probably did the same thing. The project never never came to be at that point. It still might not happen. So just so you know, it's built as part of a rate structure. If the complex doesn't move forward, uh, there'll be money available for other projects, or you can decrease the rates next year accordingly. So the approximately fifty thousand dollars in this budget for the building. Mm -hmm. I'm not following you. We, it was bonded over 20 years, the $4 million. Right, so the rate schedules reflect the principal and interest costs on the... Or what, what's that? 200000 What's Whatever the math is. She's asking what the impact is on the first year of the principal and interest. Um, whatever $4 million divided by 2 divided by 20 is. So we have uh, 210,000 in principal on the sewer side, and 168,000 in interest on the sewer side, and the water didn't kick in until 2013. Okay. So just as a, you know, an opening statement to that, that there's a risk that the capital improvements not be able to make the project move forward because they're relying on 50% of it coming from the general fund and within the capital plan itself, not an override of any sort or a debt exclusion override. So that person was the uh, 2012 water rates we set. We did meet in a small group through the board and went through the budgets. Uh, nothing has changed since our meetings that we had. I'm not sure if you want to have further discussions about the, uh, the budget or any questions that you do have for this particular rate. So did we get a new set of, a new set? Because there was discussion about a 9.5% increase. Right, we ran 9.5 for sewer and then at, um, water at 9%. And 
Do, have we seen the... the um, that was, we, we saw it in our group that subsequent to your group. Okay. Because I, did, I didn't get a, a PDF file or anything. I was looking through my email to see if we've gotten something. So it's just a thing you're handing out tonight. Water increase. Um, everyone else saw your suggestion for the update uh -huh. rates. So I think you were the only one who didn't get the final. I would like to move approval of the rates as proposed at 9.5% and 9.3% of water. And I, I just want to make a statement about this. I, I just uh, you can't can probably make a second and I'll second it for purposes of discussion. So you're moving both water and sewer together? Unless somebody's uncomfortable with that. Okay. Just to we'll do discuss them separately. I'll move approval for the uh, water rates of, uh, presented at 9.3 percent, 41 cents increase for fiscal year 12. Second for the purpose of the discussion. And I just wanted to make a statement that I think that water we don't pay enough homage to the preciousness of water <coughs> that. Um, I think that this is, even though this represents a little bit more of a percentage than previous years, I don't know that, I think it would be cheap at twice the price. It's a, water is a wonderful commodity that we use for a lot of different things, and we need to pay it forward in terms of um, uh, issues in the future, and we also need to make sure that people understand the, the preciousness of the item. Jim? Uh, I will vote for this, but, but I want to see some discussion going on about the senior citizens in the city of Northampton who can't hear a toilet leak and they get, you know, a water bill for $700. Somehow we have to make some relief for these people, uh, some way we have to be able to help that person who is having a problem with water and sewer bills. And there are not a lot of them, but there are people who need the help. And, and we ought to have some sort of a way in order to help them, either uh, put away some money or whatever. To, um, uh, to be able to uh, uh, help uh, people like this. Uh, Ned and I had discussed it at one point, and uh, there was a suggestion, I believe, that uh, there's a possibility that we could set money aside. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how, quite sure how Ned worded it, but um, Ned, uh, do you have? Well, it's been an ongoing discussion with the board for a number of years. It started back with George Andrews back in, I think it was the early 2000 era, was setting up some kind of fund for some relief for people who fall into hard times or are destitute and just can't pay a bill on occasion or something of that nature. And we've thrown out things such as looking at um, uh, water reach, which is in your board package of how many we do a year. And if we had a flat fee associated with it, rather than being as part of the enterprise fund in normal daily business, there could be a fee structure attached to a, a, a water read for a, for a house sale. And it, uh, and we ran some numbers based on um, number of sales. You can see in 2008 there was quite a few sales, 298, but it's dropped quite a bit to 2011 to 154 sales. I think it's just part of moving real estate in the city of Northampton slow down. But you can see it, you know, at these flat fees of 100, 200, and 500 dollars, it could generate a sizable pot of money. Uh, that could be not, not sizable, but you know, on, on the small side it was uh, fifteen thousand. On the upside, it was as high as one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars in a year, depending on the fee structure that you wanted. That could be set aside for assistance if you wanted to take a look at that. I mean, it's but it's not part well, of setting water rates. It's yeah. just well, in a whole other discussion in front of the board. Mike, I'm not following the information that's presented on this chart and, and 
what we're trying to do here. This is just a summary of the number of sales each month for the years 2008, 2009. What kind of sales? They're house sales. House sales. So yes, they have to read your water meter. Property transactions. <coughs> gotcha. And you have to go out and make a reading. Mm -hmm. And so the, the concept is if we choose to establish a fee for that service, there is none now. There is none. There's corporate no additional source of revenue that I'm telling and this is something. Okay. We have to generate a bill. Mm -hmm. One of them. One of them. Yeah. Contact the attorney, buyer and seller's attorney to help them. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. it, it's actually not part of setting your water rates, but Jim brought it up. It was part of a conversation that was going to have later on on your new business or informational because it's just part of your board package. That's the so, water system asset management. But the. No. no, no. It got mixed up by Jim introducing this while we we're trying to set the rates. Well, you were going to propose that the, the idea of increasing that fee as a set aside for people who need financial assistance? Uh, that's a board decision, but it's something that's been discussed but never really laid out. But is I that the I think the discussion just came up in terms of an additional source of revenue, not in terms of how that revenue is right. reduced. Yeah. So I think Ned introduced it as saying, well, there's one way of getting additional revenue that might be used for this purpose, I think is sort of Well, all right, so it, it seems to me that, that we can make a separate agenda. I, mean, I, I agree. Yeah. I just didn't want to vote on water rate increase without having that discussion that somehow we've got to take care of the senior citizens in this city. Yeah, I think everyone interested in seeing a concrete idea. I mean, we keep getting stuck on how we would vet the How people. we'd implement it and yeah. so on. But that's another discussion. We, we can right. implement this thing and, and we can set up certain criteria for how they would qualify for it and so on. Um, but it needs to be done. Yeah, that's, that's important. If we can. can I propose that uh, we put that on a future agenda. Mike. So, regarding the setting of the budget and the rate increase, I, I wanted to make sure I understood which one we're talking about. It's the, the one that results in a 41 cent increase and a 9.03, 9.03% 9 increase. I believe that's true. Okay. And uh, I support that one. Um, and my reason is primarily that uh, the Water Enterprise Fund um, uh, is still operating in the red. And, um, and, and so I think it makes sense for us to get that fund back to um, the black um, as, as quickly as we can, but without um, with reasonable increases. And although 9% is a large increase, I think we ought to consider it because of future costs that are projects that are coming along. So I, I support it for that reason. Any questions for Ned or anyone? Um, yes. I, I also want to sort of go back to where Will mentioned the preciousness of the resource, water, et cetera, and how much we depend on it. And um, that resource depends on the infrastructure that delivers the water so you can drink it or so you can put out a fire across the city, whether you're uphill or downhill or wherever you are. So uh, whether whether this increase supports a portion of a new building or replacement of a water main or a study to improve our system in some other way or to repair the leaks that we know we have, I think this is a very legitimate increase. Quite important. Did, did people happen to hear that thing on fresh air the other day, two or three days ago? It was great. This guy uh, has written a book about water. Roe mentioned it earlier. Uh, Charles Fishbeam? <coughs> he said in many parts of the world, it's just astonishing that we use drinking water to flush the toilet, to wash the car, right. to hose down the driveway. Right. Which we've talked about. Before. Yeah, it's just mind-boggling to someone living in the Middle East or uh, parts India. of it. Yeah. Um, it really is remarkable. And we have... And we're nowhere close to maintaining the system we have. If I understand this correctly, and please straighten my numbers out if I'm wrong, we're going to replace 
4,000 feet of water line this year when we redo North Street? No, that is Old Wilson Road this year. Old Wilson, sorry, Old Wilson Road. And that's out of 150 miles of water line? 100, yeah, uh, no, not, yeah, 150 miles of water line, yes. So at that rate, we're on a approximately 150 year <laughs> schedule to keep up and. 190 year schedule. Yeah, that's. <laughs> So I, I'm, I think we need to uh, begin putting money aside. That's exactly what I was thinking. And the water is great, but if you can't get it to where you're going to use it, you know, the structure of the pipes that are underground that the age, if you use the uh, weather, heavy truck traffic. We also don't have enough of it. Right. We need to expand our system. Any other questions or comments on the water rate? All in favor of approving an increase of 9.03% for FY12? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes. Any opposed? Okay. I would like to acknowledge the former director of public works Yes. presence in our room here, uh, Mr. Andrew Keating. Very honored. My, my, uh, yeah, don't go, don't go my roommate at the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> no way! Thank you so much. I would like to uh, propose the increase for fiscal year um, tw uh, 2012 of 9.5% uh, for sewer rates. 50, 46 percent uh, per cubic foot for 100 cubic foot increase. 46 cents per 100 cubic foot. Second. Okay. So everyone's had a chance to meet individually with uh, the staff. Anyone have any lingering questions about the? How, where this number came from? Or? Well, no lingering questions, but certainly the increase is uh, due in uh, part to the very aggressive program that we have to survey the system and take a look at uh, what we need to do. And I think the general public should know that. That's a good point. So this is that $900 study that is just about to get underway? It's 900000 uh, what is it, nine hundred dollars? You nine, said nine hundred dollars. Yeah, nine hundred thousand uh, dollar. <laughs> and and you know, I just have to say for myself, and Ned and I have spoken about this, and uh, and we talked about it when we met. Um, you know, we borrowed that money, and and I think this system is um, has sufficient assets that we ought to be able to pull together. Uh, we ought to be able to pay for something like that as we go. I, I hope sometime we can have a discussion about when do you borrow, when do you try to pay it as you go. Does it really make sense to be carrying a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in interest? Uh, I, I kind of you know, noodle around about that every year this comes up. And I, so I'm in, I'm, I'm in favor of trying to generate enough of a surplus that we can begin to pay for small projects as we go. I am of the same opinion. Okay. All right, so we're voting. Yeah. Jim, I'm sorry. Jim, sorry, sorry, John, I missed that. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to make a small point about the, um, the fact that the study is covered by a low interest loan. One thing that happens because of, because of that, it frees up other capital that might be able to, other capital that could be used for the need to take a loan at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you make a good point when these, when these things come up. There's obviously a lot of things to, to consider in paying without the, the cost of the service. So, so uh, the other comment we touched on it earlier is this FY12 budget includes uh, principal and debt service for the new DPW facility uh, that we haven't voted on. I think that should be clear, uh, but that we're also facing um, other, like very likely, other projects in the future. So that if the money's not spent on the DPW facility, we certainly have other reasons, very important reasons, to raise the funds. So um, 
it gives me some comfort in proceeding with this rate increase. So, all in favor of approving a 9.5% rate increase for the wastewater system? Uh, aye. 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 Uh, next would be the general fund budget. Uh, basically level funded from last year. We originally asked to take a 1.2 to 1.5 percent cut. So we looked at elimination of the winter seasonal program and a unfunded or unfilled position. Uh, the other day when I met with the mayor, she put that money back into us. So we're literally level funded this year on the general side. Questions for Ned or no. All right, all in favor of approving a level funded budget for two, FY 2012. Increase by You might want to approve that budget um, in its total, three million one hundred and fifty six thousand five hundred and eighty eight dollars. There was a slight increase um, into twenty twelve because twenty eleven had salary increases that weren't originally bud budgeted for, but there were increases for, um, I think we looked more over that detail. There was also an additional day in 2012, right. and then there was uh, NAPIA, FY 2011 salary increases, AFSCME increases, and Maine Union salary increases in 2011 that resulted in a $16,179 increase in personal services. So it's not exactly what That's right. Can we have the new number here? $3,156,588. So all in favor of approving that amount in that budget? Aye. 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 Uh, and then finally, we have the uh, Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget. <laughs> Do you have any introductory remarks about that? <laughs> solid waste. Solid waste, people. I refer to the director. Um, as discussed in our groups, that um, basically we're looking at, our estimate is that there may be a surplus at the end of the year. Um, we close up the landfill with we don't know is that with the tonnage of the landfill, how many months we may be operational into 2012, uh, or actually FY13, and obviously we'll be incurring operational costs if we continue that on. So the new rate structure, I, I still don't know if we've seen more tonnage at this point because we just started it three days ago, uh, whether or not some of the small haulers or Mr. Dusos come back. But uh, you know, this is projection that we're closing in uh, June of, uh, uh, excuse me, 2012. And like I said, it appears to we have a surplus. We appear to be covering all our closure, post closure costs, uh, payoffs of the property. As dis discussed earlier, we went through and we made some, I think, solid assumptions based on some additional revenue sources such as Amoresco and the cell tower base revenue to help offset some of these costs that we're having on the enterprise fund. Um, and. Uh, it's really, I mean, there's no change from our other conversations that we have. I appreciate the staff uh, taking time to have these morning meetings and really helping us. Not a problem. All in favor of approving the Solid Waste Enterprise, Enterprise Fund budget for FY212? Aye. 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 Okay. Sweet. Anne Marie, thank you. Unless you want to hang out, I mean, don't. Yeah. Yeah. Why if I have some more jokes? Oh, no way. Thanks for being here. It's uh, five, four of seven. Yeah, I gotta go. Yeah, Perry is leaving. So very busy. Very busy. Snowmobile policy. Do you want to? Oh, absolutely. No, no I'm fine. I, I, I don't want to offend it. I can move over there. <laughs> I'm going to bend you. No, you wouldn't. Oh, no. Let the man leave. How about that? Okay. 
uh, snowmobile gun policy along with visuals. Yeah, nice map. Yeah. The board was provided. <coughs> Hi, Terry. Hi, Terry. Oh, I, the was provided with a very nice map. You call it. Mm -hmm. um, large format. Which is related to the snowmobile policy. Uh, we have up in the city watersheds surrounding the Ryan Westway and Mount Street Reservoirs. We've operated for a number of years um, with sort of an unwritten policy in terms of allowing snowmobile access uh, on certain, uh, certain cart paths and roadways within the water. Um, through the process of working with DEP on our updated watershed resource protection plan, they had asked uh, that we develop written policies in regards to how we allow access or don't allow access up on the watershed property that we own. Um, we're currently working on uh, sort of an overarching public access policy, which will be coming before the board probably in the next meeting. We're still going through some legal things with the city solicitor on that. But we have finished this policy on snowmobiling, which uh, which was distributed and, and is fairly straightforward, I think, in terms of what we allow. Um, this policy, there, there, there's a network of snowmobile trails throughout western Massachusetts. The name on that's a snowmobile enthusiast would know. It's quite an, quite an amazing um, connected network. Um, there's, uh, there's a route, the Snowmobile 93 corridor, which goes up on the west side of the Ryan Reservoir, which, which is why you get the map, so you can kind of see the area that we're talking about. We work closely with the, uh, with the snowmobile clubs. If you had a chance to read the policy, it's, it's, not, it's not overly long, but um, essentially in the past, um, we've had meetings and conversations with the Berge Bullets and the, and the Conway Snowmobile Clubs. Um, to discuss uh, use of uh, city property for the snowmobile trails. Um, these clubs have been they're quite responsible in terms of their use of the property and assisting with uh, road maintenance and other activities that facilitate their use for snowmobile uh, activities. So this, the policies um, details the things that we've typically, is the way we've typically run them sort of the unwritten rules of the way we do business. So this puts those rules into writing um, related to the watershed. And essentially, we, they, they've requested in the past access, and then we would review these things with them and then give them year-to-year -year authorization for approval to access the trails. The state has to approve these? The state has asked to see our written policy. Okay. Yeah. So I guess in essence they'll be, I don't know if they'll be giving us a specific approval, but they will be reviewing the policy. So, so we would we would get a conditional approval here, pending the states. Yeah, for next year. Approved. Yeah, for next, yeah, right. For, for the next year. So we'll, there isn't a, 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 a proposal on the table. Did you just did that? Just that did so, that. so moved just yeah. like that. I and then moved the no, no policy access. as written. Second. Was there a second? Any more discussion? And this is My pending state approval. Pending state approval. My question is just about liability in general. What if somebody runs into a rock and is seriously injured? And there's a problem with that. <coughs> And I don't. I guess I don't expect an answer, but I. It seems like there's a potential question. I'm sure there's some liability there. But are we supposed to remove the rocks from the trails? Or? The snowmobile clubs maintain the trails and keep them in working order. Part of the policy, they're not supposed to be on the trails that are, you know, have uh, less than a foot of snow on it, but. You're right, there are trees on the side of the trails, there's rocks on the side of the trails, they cross bridges that they have created uh, and made and up, upkeep. It is our property, so I assume if you get hurt on our property like your own home, you may have a liability. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is sort of flows from that and, and are there riders other than members of the two clubs that use um, these corridors? 
Well, I guess we have no way of knowing other than observing activity on the trail. Um, the snowmobile clubs, it turns out, are, are I guess they're pretty close-knit uh, in terms of you knowing who, who's members of the club or not. We're requiring that uh, the trail users be members of the Snowmobile Association of Massachusetts. And actually, these two clubs that we referenced here have been useful in the past in helping us identify people that have been using the trail that aren't members. And if we have a problem with people going off the trail that's approved, they help us identify who, you know, who's been, who, who's basically been out there on a snowmobile that's, that hasn't been abiding by the rules. So they actually help, the clubs have been useful in, for, in enforcing the rules because we, you know, we tell them that if, if there's a lot of folks out there that aren't abiding by the rules, we'll just, we'll just withdraw the permission for anybody to use the trails. So the clubs have been very good to work with. They've been really partners in terms of uh, you know the implementation of the policy. One other thing too is that um, this doesn't need to be approved tonight. I think um, I don't really know the answer to uh, to David's question, but we can certainly talk to the city solicitor about insurance and liability and how that uh, how that's carried through. Are the, are the trails posted um, yeah. as far as um, who can use them? The trails are posted yeah. for snowmobile use. I'm wondering if there's a there's a way to um, start to control our our risk here by um, putting some of the requirements of the policy in the posting, and, and maybe it's just that they need to be a member of the Snowmobile Association of Massachusetts. Yeah, so I was going to say something similar that before you right. go to Fitzgerald Lake, before you go to a lot of places, there is a board that is there that talks about what the rules are and why you can't have it at every entry point. We, we're, uh, we're actually working on, um, on putting together um, kiosks to provide information where public access is allowed and not allowed so that we can cover some of these things. Cool. Another question was, um, there's a, in the second paragraph it's, it says that annual approval from the city is required and uh, I'm guessing that's approval for the two snowmobile clubs, is that what, is that? Who receives the approval? Yes. It's not by rider. No, no, by club. So maybe we want to talk about that. I think so. Um, Jim uh, proposed this, but I understand from you that we're not going to approve it tonight. Well, you don't have to. No. David's no. David asked a good question about liability. I just right. wanted to let you know that there's no pressing need okay. to approve it tonight. We can bring it back. Uh, because I mentioned that we're going to be back in front of the board with a uh, with an overall policy for public access. So when we discuss that, we can bring this up again and have further discussion about it. Mr. Clerk, I withdraw my motion. Right. I withdraw my second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? So we'll wait for you to bring it up with, with the public access. Uh, discussion of below three grade responsibilities in buildings. Is this uh, as was Terry. Terry. Wasn't that I was Terry. And I, as I was going to say, plus it comes out of our claims discussion. So I'm going to move that we table it. Is anybody supportive of that? Okay. Okay, thank you. Change order, may I move on? Change order number one to contract number 185-11 for winter salt to We Care Organics in the amount of $10,168.50. Move approval. Second. And a small orange in our, our annual contract that we put out every year for uh, chemical control for winter. Not a big thing, but it's it's a small orange in the original contract. Okay. Is this a non-salt? Pardon me? Non-salt. This is salt, treated salt. Treated salt. Okay. I'm just curious, what was the original contract? I don't remember. The original contract was 3,000 tons. 3,000 tons. Right. This is an additional 120.11 tons of material. What was the value of the original contract? The value of the original contract was $253,980. Thanks. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any approved? I mean, any against? 
contract for wastewater treatment plant sludge disposal to Moortown Landfill incorporated in the amount not to exceed three hundred and seventy two thousand four hundred dollars. This is a one year contract with two one year renewables at the sole discretion of the city with a CPI Northeast increase to it. Um, the bids range widely this year from a low of uh, $66.50 a ton at Moortown Landfill to a high of um, $120 a ton uh, for New England Organics. It's for 5,500 5, tons of uh, cake sludge a year and um, I believe 100 tons of grits each year. Uh, what's happened in the past, they've gone to incineration and we've been able to take our grease and grits up to the landfill for disposal. Going forward, the landfill closing, we're not going to be able to do that. We need to find a new home and the incinerators won't take that material. That's why you see a, a variable on grits and um, sludge disposal because, uh, like I said, the grits can't go to the incinerator. Uh, neither can the grease, apparently it clogs the nozzles. So, uh, the only change I would ask you on this, if you are going to approve this, is that um, uh, Moortown Landfill Inc. needs permission from the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources to accept this waste into their landfill. Uh, we submitted the analyticals to them at this point, and we're waiting for that letter of approval. So it's a conditional contract at this point. Even though they, they do have two other backup sources in Pennsylvania to use as disposal sites, they're focusing on Vermont for their closest disposal site. And there's no reason for us to believe that we won't be accepted there. Our, our sludge should meet the criteria needed. That's correct. I spoke with Dave Domenico of the Agency of Natural Resources Solid Waste Division who oversees that landfill and he did not appear to have an issue with that coming to the facility. But we just have to uh, pass the, uh, the, the requirements of the state of Vermont. Just so you know, last year it was $79.29 a ton. And this year it's $66.50, so we're saving quite a bit of money. It's going to be $70,000 a year savings in this contract. Uh, yes. Just to be clear, this, this contract price is for um, the estimated amount of sludge and grit that we generate. That's correct. Both the, the same price, $66.50 a ton. And we were not paying this year because we were getting The grits go to the landfill. Oh, oh, for the grits. For the grits. Um, underneath the contract, our estimate was 100 tons of grit per year and 5,500 tons of wet sludge. Jim and Rick here. With the increase in Coca-Cola's flow, is that going to give us an increase in sludge? I would imagine it would be a small increase in sludge. Oh, we don't know. I don't know. We're actually currently working at that as part of the study that SCA is doing. The board had approved a reevaluation of the VOD uh, surcharge. And it was part of, uh, okay. part of that task. Yeah. They're working on that now. They are meeting on next Tuesday morning. Uh, I, I'm not familiar. I re recall the conversation about sludge and cake, but I'm not sure I know what grits. Grits are heavy materials that fall off at the headworks of the plant. So small stones, pavement, rubble, uh, heavy materials. And it's pulled off out of the headworks. And that's where the grease uh, will coagulate also. So it's all thrown together in the hopper. So the southern breakfast food? Yeah. I was going to sausage, you know. What, what <laughs> The two-year renewal Wait, options. Not southern food. <laughs> the <laughs> options for renewal is it our option or their option? Our sole discretion. Awesome. Okay. Are there any more questions about um, this contract? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It is a good price. Contract for the. Should we wait for you to yeah. join? One second. <laughs> Contract for the biennial inspection of Hannah Brook to Stantec Consulting Services in the amount of four thousand dollars. Approval. Second. Second. We have a DEP regulatory requirement to do a review of the Hannah Brook wetland every couple of years. Um, so Stantec has been doing this for. Uh, I don't know, 12 years or something that effect since, the, since it was a, a requirement by DDP. Um, so that's, this year's 
just the watching every time that it needs to be done. Questions or issues? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Number 11, change order number 1 to contract number 6811 for computer network support services in the amount of $6,000. Second. This is the annual contract we have with the Data Foundry uh, for providing the network services. One of the goals of this past year was that the MIS department was going to take over this work and they haven't yet. Uh, that and a couple uh, server failures here, uh, the contract with Data Foundry is winding down with $35,000 that we had set aside. So uh, speaking with George Danziger, the owner of the company, he thought that the Five to six thousand dollar range would cover him through the fiscal year. So, uh, change order request of six thousand dollars to carry our services through the remainder of the fiscal year. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Change order number one to contract number 222 11 for a lead shape decommissioning feasibility study to AECOM for in the amount of eight hundred and seventy four dollars. No approval. Can we afford it? Solid way. Nice decision. Um, we have a contract with the AV column uh, to prepare a feasibility study for decommissioning of the leachate uh, treatment plant at the landfill. And after we received the draft report from AECOM, we, we asked them if they could provide uh, an estimate. Uh, to demolish the building. So they've given us a feasibility study for just decommissioning the building with associated cost estimates to do that. And based on the cost estimates, we decided that it would be useful information to know how much it would be just to tear the whole building down. And uh, they did that work for us. And then when they were done, they said it cost them $174 more than the original budget. So it was not a scope item that we requested. Any questions or issues? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Water System Asset Management Plan proposals. So, I think at the last the legislation here again, I guess maybe we were still looking for volunteers. Um, I think at the last board meeting, um, I, I indicated that we're working on uh, requests for proposals to develop a water system asset management plan. And we were looking for uh, two board members to volunteer um, to become involved in the selection of a consultant for the, uh, for the purposes of selecting a firm to help us on the water system. Um, we, we did a similar process on the stormwater utility project, and uh, the board's input was really quite valuable going through that process. Um, and we'd like to do that again and have two board members serve on the selection committee. So the, the work involved with that would be reading the RFP when it's issued, uh, reviewing proposals when they come in, and ranking the proposals, and attending um, interviews with the shortlisted consultants and helping with a recommendation for the hiring of the company. Um, so David had helped on the stormwater utility project and, and uh, was, was a big help. I think you've got a a sense of the amount of time it took you to, to do that. I mean, at least it's, it's an assignment with a, yeah. an end deadline, which is always good. Kind of how, how thick is the pile? <laughs> <laughs> as many as we get. <laughs> and when does this begin, approximately? Um, didn't I put the finishing touches on the, on the RFP right now, and we hope to have that you know, all over the next week or two. And then uh, it'll take about a month for the proposals to come in. And then you'll have a couple of weeks to review them, and then we'll the schedule interviews based on people's availability after that. Any volunteers? Yeah, sure. Maybe Dave? I should point out that I should not participate because my employer might might okay. choose to submit. We'll get you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Right. Thank you, Dave. Um, right. Along those lines, mm -hmm. um, I should not have participated in the discussion regarding the Wartown landfill because there's a chance that my employer still works for them, so I will not be signing this contract. Okay. Uh, 
starting date for claims committee before meet before the next meeting. Sure. So five o'clock. Five. Okay. And that would be on the twenty eighth. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. Uh have we already looked at this one? I don't remember one on State Street. It's an abatement request that we've been doing with the terminal, uh, filed by uh, Alan Burson. He had a water leak and we abated uh, one reading of his water for the sewer bill and he did not fix the leak and it continued and he wants continued abatement and I told him no. He asked if it was appealable and I said of course it is so he asked for an appeal meeting with the claims committee. Okay. Maybe we should get it 525. <laughs> the judgment is not something that it would be good. 515 on the 27th. Um, food waste collection. Yeah, we, um, we're currently working on uh, revising uh, the food waste pilot program. Um, the program has been quite successful. We've got about 350 uh, households that are participating in that right now. Um, and I think the first, we're at the point in this pilot program where I think we need to figure, well, we've got, we've got almost a year's worth of data. So we know about what our operational costs are to, to provide this type of service. So moving forward, what we want to do is develop a, a fee-for-service program on this to determine, um, you know, how many people are going to, how many households are going to continue to participate in the program once we institute the fee. And then based on that, we'll look at um, potential expansion of the program or other things. But I think we're at this stage in the pilot test, um, pilot program, where we need to, now that we know what the costs are to run the program, we need to figure out if those costs are, are willing to be borne by the, the folks that are using the program. Do you so, have a, a general ballpark of what the fees might end up being? If it were, if it was three hundred fifty dollars? I think we're going to come back to the board with a specific proposal in terms of the fee um, for that. So we will be prepared to provide more of a presentation of cost at that time. Okay. We were hoping to be ready tonight for that, but we won't want to be prepared for it. But where does it go if it doesn't? Uh, Come to you as garbage. Goes right. in the regular right. trash bag, right? Mimi, did you have something? Yeah. Is this being maintained where it's currently being, like at the farm that you're currently working, or are you looking at a different way of doing this program? We're not really looking at any changes in the program other than making it a fee for service program to cover the costs for it. And I think that's important for us in the last year of operation of the landfill to know what the costs are for the program. So if we do it, if we offer it in the future, we'll know if it'll, it'll support itself. I don't, I don't know anything about the program. So where do you take your garbage? Uh, it goes to Belcher Town to a, a small farm institute where they compost it. Okay, I guess I wondered around. Where do we collect the garbage? I'm sorry. We collect it here at Walker Street. Okay. We go bring it in those compost containers that were well, I guess I missed that one. I'm at comp I compost a lot right. of stuff. I just but don't this compost meat. Meat we'll and fish yeah. and really? everything. Yeah. Huh? But <coughs> there's example. People just had to come pick up a compost bucket. Oh. They, they didn't have to use that bucket. You don't have to use the bucket. It was a nice little gimme, I think, to help entice folks. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes. They, they saw waste, waste. I think, said they were going to have a uh, surplus of money. Is this something that can be tied into that? Uh, as far as helping reduce the fee in some, some way for the participants? It's, it's just an idea. Well, the sur I don't think there's an actual surplus um, as presented earlier. Uh, I think that was a, um, a number that was taken off a table um, to illustrate discussion of options mm -hmm. and not actually reflective of this pot of money that we can use for things. Okay. Um, in fact, that 
that table reflected an increase in the vehicle sticker, which I don't believe we've discussed with the board yet either. No. So there's a number of things there. Okay. okay. But that was not. Uh, yeah. I'm, um, I think Smith College is doing a certain amount of food waste recycling, and I, I really don't know where that stands right now, but I know they, they did a pilot program, they learned something, they lost their site, they started another one, and I think that one's still working. I don't know. Is there a, is there a way to combine that? Is there a reason to combine? Is there, do you know about it? We are aware of it, and I think one of the, one of the things that's keeping our cost uh, our operational cost down is the fact that Smith is doing a program. Mm -hmm. So there's collection in the area that's coordinated with the collection here. Yeah. So that there's a savings in terms of transport costs by the fact that these programs programs exist together. Right. So it's it's good. One other thing, Gary, is that I wanted to mention is that a lot of folks were excited about the program that do composting at home because we do take a lot of material here that people would normally compost at home. I participate participate in the program because there's some things, you know, like there's some meat or other things right. that you wouldn't deal with at home that we'll take here. So yeah. it's good. That's okay. a nice way to supplement the collection. Sure. Thanks. I think George may have something to say. George, do you have something to say? On the collection? Yeah. Of, uh, uh, no? Uh, oh, David, yeah. don't make it. No, no, on the, on the next. On the next yeah. item? Well, we don't have a next item. We're actually going to go around. Right, we're going to go around. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So I was going to start with Gary because he's right to my left. <laughs> Great. Do you have any questions or things to bring up? I do, and it probably maybe has something to do with why George is here. And it's something I've been thinking about, and it sort of finally became a conscious thought. Um, and it partly was driven by the newspaper article about the cost of the... Uh, the new facility here, the DPW, and it mentioned something about the police station about ready to do something, and I don't, I, it's, I don't recall now what it said exactly. Whether it's, I don't think it's break ground or, or that it's been the funding's been approved, or how close are we on that? Well, the funding is approved. There was an override to, to fund it, right? And they're ready to break ground. I think. So, down. so they do have everything has been bid. And, it's yep. under contract at this point. Uh, it's not our project, so I don't know the exact specifics, but we met with them about trench permits and relocating the initial drains and sewers they need to start before they can even start the break ground for the new building. Yeah. They need to relocate these utilities out of the way. Okay. Well, that answers my question. I wasn't sure how far along it was, and the thought was, why not combine the two facilities? But that doesn't seem like it's okay. We could do it as a change room. <laughs> 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 Change order number one, nineteen million dollars. So you want to move the DPW downtown? It would, we might have to. <laughs> All right, George, did you have some comment on Gary's statement? Uh, I just asked the, the yeah. question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Jim, do you have anything? Uh, no, just the twenty seventh is the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask for. Um, an update in the future on where we are with the DPW facility and and a, sort of an education of where we were with a nine million dollar estimate and how we got to the current estimate and what it includes and and all of those issues because I think for the board members that aren't on the building committee mm -hmm. um, I think we need that information. Okay. It'll be on the next agenda. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, the mayor made an announcement today. Uh, she'll be leaving office September 9th, so we'll have an acting mayor till the end of the year. Uh, she's uh, been offered a job up in Greenfield that she plans to take. So I just want to make that so the board members are aware of her leaving early. And then I wanted to see if the board would recognize George, so he could, uh, George Andrew Keyes, the previous director, uh, he represented me in front of Capital Improvements Committee tonight to discuss the DPW facility. I, like to hear what they had to say. Do we want to hear what they had to say? <laughs> <coughs> we do want to hear what they had to say. First of all, I am not going to forgive the present director for putting me in the difficult <laughs> 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 appear in front of the Capital Improvements Committee. But, uh, I believe the presentation went well. Uh, the Capital Improvements recognizes the need uh, for a DPW uh, corrective facility, if you want to call it that. 
the presentation uh, included everything that we need up to the $26 million, which is, includes the, the dream, if you want to call it that. The discussion um, eventually, towards the end of the meeting, centered on two things. One was, is that a tier one need, and there was unanimous, that the need of the DPW, whatever the, the ultimate project's going to be, is number one. It also made tier one, okay, and that is when it got a little bit confusing among the, 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 the members. There is a question that there is, first of all, there is no question in their mind that a new vehicle maintenance facility, new administration employee facility workshops is 100% necessary. There was a question mark on the need for vehicle storage right now because, you know, it's an expensive item. I believe the way they worded their um, motion, it still stays in tier one. But, you know, there was the, the question mark that was left out in the open. So I, I, I think that ultimately they approved the $16 million project as being tier one with a caveat of can we find some alternatives for the vehicle storage uh, are they really necessary right now and I believe that's how it's going to go to the moon. there was no recommendation concerning the remaining project beyond the 16 million you know the canopy storages the wash bays and for your information, what we call phase one includes the vehicle maintenance facility, the administration component which will house the streets of the highway and the water division, uh, the former employee facilities, uh, the parking facilities, common rooms and what have you workshops uh, that will deal not only with the needs of the DPW but also the needs of the central services uh, of people who are coming up and a small vehicle storage shed for approximately 35 vehicles and ancillary equipment. It will also include the uh, rehabilitation or reconstruction of the surface components of the uh, fuel depot and the gantry system for the sanders. Uh, it's a canopy with a gantry system for the existing sanders of, of the DPW. Call it phase two includes everything else which starts with the possibility of uh, removal of the existing barns and construction of a much larger vehicle storage facility or the canopies uh, that are, are missing from uh, phase one and uh, ultimately the expansion of the McNulty building. And that's approximately uh, $10 million? I mean... From 16 to 26, yes. 16. Yes. The, the big ticket item is uh, the large vehicle storage facility. The barns is going to hold approximately 35 to 37 large pieces of equipment uh, in order to accommodate them modern facility you need a fairly large building mm -hmm. and that's the expert. Thank you for Thank you, George. Just before a clarification, what does tier one mean? Tier one is okay. the priority that they expect money to be appropriate or funded this coming year. Okay. The recommendations you now will go to the mayor. Uh, the mayor ultimately uh, has the responsibility of approving and also has the responsibility of finding the money. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, although the mayor does consider uh, the committee's recommendations in Tier 1 and Tier 2, it is her ultimate decision to set the priorities and uh, Sometimes they come out a little different. 
is it still targeted that uh, half of the cost will come from the enterprise fund? Yes. Okay. So. Do you have anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Jim? Okay. David? Make a motion, we adjourn. Second. Second. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.